Chapter Ten, Part Two of Constance Dunlap by Arthur B. Reeve. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The blackmailers continued. Anita Douglas saw it all now. Things had not been going fast enough to suit her new friend, Mrs. Murray. So after a time she had begun to tell her of her own escapades and to try to get Anita to admit that she had had similar adventures. It was a favorite device of detectives, working under the new psychological method by use of the law of suggestion. She had introduced herself, had found out about Lynn Monroe, and in some way, after he had left town, had got the letters. Was he in the plot, too? She could not believe it. Suddenly the thought came to her that the blackmailers might give her husband material that would look very black if a suit for divorce came up in court. What if he were able to cut off her little allowance? She trembled at the thought of being thus cast adrift on the world. Anita Douglas did not know which way to turn. In her dilemma, she thought only of Constance. She hurried to her. "'It was as you said, a frame-up,' she blurted out as she entered Constance's apartment. Then, in the same breath, added, "'That Mrs. Murray was just a stool-pigeon.' Constance received her sympathetically. She had expected such a visit, though not so soon. "'Just how much do they know?' she asked pointedly. Anita pressed her hands together nervously. "'Really, I confess,' she murmured. "'Indiscretions, yes. Misconduct, no!' She spoke the last words defiantly. Constance listened eagerly, though she did not betray it. She had found out that it was a curious twist in feminine psychology that the lie under such circumstances was a virtue, that it showed that there was still hope for such a woman— Admission of the truth, even to a friend, would have shown that the woman was hopelessly lost. Lie or not, Constance felt in her inmost heart that she approved of it. "'Still, it looks badly,' she remarked. "'Perhaps it does, on the surface,' persisted Anita. "'You poor, dear creature,' soothed Constance. "'I don't say I blame you for your indiscreet friendships. You are more sinned against than sinning.' Sympathy had its effect." Anita was now sobbing softly as Constance stole her arm about her waist. The next question, she reasoned, considering aloud, is, of course, what to do. If it was just one of these blackmailing detective cases, it would be common, but still very hard to deal with. There's a lot of such blackmailing going on in New York. Next to business and political cases, I suppose, it is the private detective's most important graft. Nearly everybody has a past, although few are willing to admit it. The graft lies in the fact that people talk so much, are so indiscreet, take such reckless chances. It's a wonder, really, that there isn't more of it. Yet there is the evidence, as he called it, my letters to Lynn, and the reports that that woman must have made of our, our conversations, groaned Anita. How they may distort it all! Constance was thinking rapidly. It's now after four o'clock, she said finally, looking at her wristwatch. You say it was not half an hour ago that Drummond called on you. He must be downtown about now. Your husband will hardly have a chance more than to glance over the papers this afternoon. Suddenly an idea seemed to occur to her. What do you suppose he will do with them? she asked. Mrs. Douglas looked up through her tears, calmer. He is very methodical, she answered slowly. If I know him rightly, I think he will probably go out to Glen Clare with them tonight to look them over. "'Where will he keep them?' broke in Constance suddenly. "'He has a little safe in the library out there, where he keeps all such personal papers. I shouldn't be surprised if he looked them over and locked them up there until he intends to use them, at least until morning.' "'I have a plan,' exclaimed Constance excitedly. "'Are you game?' Anita Douglas looked at her friend squarely. In her face Constance read the desperation of a woman battling for life and honor. "'Yes,' replied Anita in a low, tense tone. "'For anything. "'Then meet me after dinner in the terminal. "'We'll go out to Glen Clare. "'The two looked deeply into each other's eyes. "'Nothing was said, but what each read was a sufficient answer "'to a host of unspoken questions. "'A moment after Mrs. Douglas had gone, "'Constance opened a cabinet. "'From the false back of a drawer she took two little vials of powder and a small bottle with a sponge. 
Then she added a long steel bar with a peculiar turn at the end to her paraphernalia for the trip. Nothing further occurred until they met at the terminal, or, in fact, on the journey out. On most of the ride, Mrs. Douglas kept her face averted, looking out of the window into the blackness of the night. Perhaps she was thinking of other journeys out to Glen Clare. Perhaps she was afraid of meeting the curious gaze of any late sojourners who might suffer from acute suburban curiosity. Quietly, the two women alighted and made their way from the station up the main street, then diverged to a darker and less frequented avenue. "'There's the house,' pointed out Mrs. Douglas, halting Constance, with a little bitter exclamation. Evidently, she had reasoned well. He had gone out there early, and there was a light in the library. "'He isn't much of a reader,' whispered Mrs. Douglas. "'Oh, it's clear to me that he has the stuff all right. He's devouring it, gloating over it.' The sound of footsteps approaching down the paved walk came to them. Loitering on the streets of a suburban town always occasions suspicion, and instinctively Constance drew Anita with her into the shadow of a hedge that set off the house from that next to it. There was no fence cutting it off from the sidewalk, but at the corner of the plot a large bush stood. In this bower they were perfectly hidden in the shadow. Hour after hour they waited, watching that light in the library speculating what it was he was reading, while Anita, half afraid to talk, wondered what it was that Constance had in mind. Finally, the light in the library winked out, and the house was in darkness. Midnight passed, and with it the last belated suburbanite. At last, when the moon had disappeared under some clouds, Constance pulled Anita gently along, up the lawn. There was no sign of life about the house, yet Constance observed all the caution she would have if it had been well guarded. Quickly they advanced over the open space to the cottage, approaching in the shadow as much as possible. Tiptoeing over the porch, Constance tried a window, the window through which had shone the tantalizing light. It was fastened. Without hesitation she pulled out the long steel bar with the twisted head, and began to insert the sharp end between the sashes. "'Aren't you afraid?' chattered her companion. No, she whispered, not looking up from her work. You know, most persons don't know enough about Jimmy's. Against them an ordinary door lock or window catch is no protection at all. Why, with this Jimmy, even a woman can exert a pressure of a ton or so. Not one catch in a thousand can stand it. Certainly not this one. Constance continued to work, muffling the lever as much as possible in a piece of felt. At last, a quick wrench and the catch yielded. The only thing wrong about it was the noise. There had been no wind, no passing trolley, nothing to conceal it. They shrank back into the shadow and waited, breathless. Had it been heard? Would a window open presently and an alarm be sounded? There was not a sound save the rustle of the leaves in the night wind. A few minutes later, Constance carefully raised the lower sash, and they stepped softly into the house, once the house over which Anita Douglas had been mistress. Cautiously, Constance pressed the button on a little pocket storage battery lamp and flashed it slowly about the room. All was quiet in the library. The library table was disordered, as if someone in great stress of mind had been working at it. Anita wondered what had been the grim thoughts of the man as he pondered on the mass of stuff, the tissue of falsehoods that the blackmailing detective had handed to him, at such great cost. At last the cone of light rested on a little safe at the opposite end. "'There it is,' whispered Anita, pointing, half afraid even of the soft tones of her own voice. Constance had pulled down all the shades quietly and drew the curtains tightly between the room and the foyer. On the top of the safe she was pouring some of the powder in a neat pile from one of the vials. "'What is that?' asked Anita, bending close to her ear. "'Some powdered metallic aluminum mixed with oxide of iron,' whispered Constance in return. "'I read of this thing in a scientific paper the other day, and I determined to get some of it. But I didn't think I'd ever really have occasion to use it.' She added some powder from the other vial. "'And that?' "'Magnesium powder.' Constance had lighted a match. "'Stand back, Anita,' she whispered. "'Pack, Anita,' she whispered. 
back in the farthest corner of the room and keep quiet. Shut your eyes. Turn your face away. There was a flash, blinding, then a steady, brilliant burst of noiseless, penetrating, burning flame. Anita had expected an explosion. Instead, she found that her eyes hurt. She had not closed them tightly quick enough. Still, Constance's warning had been sufficient to prevent any damage to the sight, and she slowly recovered. Actually, the burning powder seemed to be sinking into the very steel of the safe itself, as if it had been mere ice. Was it an optical illusion, a freak of her sight? Well, what is it? she whispered in awe, drawing closer to her friend. Thermite, whispered Constance in reply, as the two watched the glowing mass fascinated. An invention of a German chemist called Goldschmidt. It will burn a hole right through steel, at a terrific temperature. Three thousand or more degrees. The almost burned out mass seemed to fall into the safe as if it had been a wooden box instead of chrome steel. They waited a moment, still blinking, to regain control over their eyes, in spite of the care they had used to shield them. Then they tiptoed across the floor. In the top of the safe yawned a hole large enough to stick one's hand and arm through. Constance reached into the safe and drew out something on which she flashed the pocket light. There was bundle after bundle of checks, the personal checks of a methodical businessman carefully preserved. Hastily, she looked them over. All seemed to be perfectly straight. Payments to tradesmen, to real estate agents, payments of all sorts, all carefully labeled. Oh, he'd never let anything like that lie around, remarked Anita, as she began to comprehend what Constance was after. Constance was scrutinizing some of the checks more carefully than others. Suddenly, she held one up to the light. Apparently, it was in payment of legal services. Quickly, she took the little bottle of brownish fluid which she had brought with the sponge. She dipped the sponge in it lightly and brushed it over the check. Then she leaned forward breathlessly. Eradicating ink is simply a bleaching process, she remarked, which leaves the iron of the ink as a white oxide instead of a black oxide. The proper reagent will restore the original color, partially and at least for a time. Ah, yes, it is as I thought. There have been erasures in these checks. Other names have been written in on some of them in place of those that were originally there. The sulfide of ammonia ought to bring out anything that is hidden here. There, faintly, was the original writing. It read, Pay to the order of Helen Brett. Mrs. Douglas with difficulty restrained an exclamation of anger and hatred at the mere sight of the name of the other woman. He was careful, remarked Constance. Reckless at first in giving checks, he has tried to cover it up. He didn't want to destroy them, yet he couldn't have such evidence about, so he must have altered the name on the cancelled vouchers after they were returned to him paid by the bank. Very clever, very. Constance reached into the safe again. There were some personal and some business letters, some old checkbooks, some silver and gold trinkets and table silver. She gave a low exclamation. She had found a packet of letters and a sheaf of typewritten, flimsy, tissue-paper pages. Mrs. Douglas uttered a little cry, quickly suppressed. The letters were those in her own handwriting, addressed to Lynn Monroe. "'Here are Drummond's reports, too,' Constance added. She looked them hastily over. The damning facts had been massed in a way that must inevitably have prejudiced any case for the defense that Mrs. Douglas might set up. "'There, there's all the evidence against you,' whispered Constance hoarsely, handing it over to Anita. "'It's all yours again. Destroy it.' In her eagerness, with trembling hands, Anita had torn up the whole mass of incriminating papers and had cast them into the fireplace. She was about to strike a match. Suddenly there came a deep voice from the stairs. "'Well, what's all this?' Anita dropped the match from her nerveless hands. Constance felt an arm grasp her tightly. For a moment a chill ran over her at being caught in the nefarious work of breaking and entering a dwelling-house at night. The hand was Anita's, but the voice was that of a man. Lights flashed all over the house at once from a sort of electric light system that could be instantly lighted and would act as a burglar expeller. It was Douglas himself, he was staring angrily at his wife and the stranger with her. "'Well,' 
he demanded with cold sarcasm. Why this, this burglary? Before he could quite take in the situation, with a quick motion, Constance struck a match and touched it to the papers in the fireplace. As they blazed up, he caught sight of what they were and almost leaped across the floor. Constance laid her hand on his arm. "'One moment, Mr. Douglas,' she said quietly. "'Look at that.' "'Who? Who the devil are you?' he gasped. "'What's all this?' "'I think,' remarked Constance slowly and quietly, "'that your wife is now in a position to prove that you, well, don't come into court with clean hands, if you attempt to do so. Besides, you know, the courts rather frown on detectives that practice collusion and conspiracy and frame up evidence, to say nothing of trying to blackmail the victims. I thought perhaps you'd prefer not to say anything about this, er, visit tonight, after you saw that. Constance had quietly laid one of the erased checks on the library table. Again she dipped the sponge into the brownish liquid, Again the magic touch revealed the tell-tale name. With her finger, she was pointing to the faintly legible Helen Brett on the check as the sulfide had brought it out. Douglas stared, dazed. He rubbed his eyes and stared again as the last of the flickering fire died away. In an instant he realized that it was not a dream, that it was all a fact. He looked from one to the other of the women. He was checkmated. Constance ostentatiously folded up the erased vouchers. "'I—I I shall not make any contest,' Douglas managed to gasp huskily. End of Chapter 10 Chapter 11, Part 1 of Constance Dunlap by Arthur B. Reeve This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Dope Fiends "'I have a terrible headache,' remarked Constance Dunlap to her friend Adele Gordon, the petite cabaret singer and dancer of the Mayfair, who had dropped in to see her one afternoon. "'You poor, dear creature,' soothed Adele. "'Why don't you go see Dr. Price? He has cured me. He's splendid, splendid.' Constance hesitated. Dr. Moreland Price was a well-known physician. All day and even at night, she knew, automobiles and cabs rolled up to his door, and their occupants were— for the most part, stylishly gowned women. "'Oh, come on,' urged Adele. "'He doesn't charge as highly as people seem to think. Besides, I'll go with you and introduce you, and he'll charge only as he does the rest of us in the profession.' Constance's head throbbed frantically. She felt that she must have some relief soon. "'All right,' she agreed. "'I'll go with you, and thank you, Adele.' Dr. Price's office was on the first floor of the fashionable Recherche apartments, and, as she expected, Constance noted a line of motor-cars before it. They entered and were admitted to a richly furnished room in mahogany and expensive Persian rugs, where a number of patients waited. One after another an attendant summoned them noiselessly and politely to see the doctor, until at last the turn of Constance and Adele came. Dr. Price was a youngish, middle-aged man, tall, with a sallow countenance, and a self-confident, polished manner which went a long way in reassuring the patients, most of whom were ladies. As they entered the doctor's sanctum behind the folding doors, Adele seemed to be on very good terms indeed with him. They seated themselves in the deep leather chairs beside Dr. Price's desk, and he inclined his head to listen to the story of their ailments. "'Doctor,' began Constance's introducer, "'I've brought my friend, Mrs. Dunlap, who is suffering from one of those awful headaches.' I thought perhaps you could give her some of that medicine that has done me so much good. The doctor bowed without saying anything and shifted his eyes from Adele to Constance. Just what seems to be the difficulty, he inquired. Constance told him how she felt, of her general lassitude and the big throbbing veins in her temples. Ah, a woman's headaches, he smiled, adding, nothing serious, however, in this case, as far as I can see. We can fix this one all right, I think. He wrote out a prescription quickly and handed it to Constance. "'Of course,' he added as he pocketed his fee, "'it makes no difference to me personally, but I would advise that you have it filled at Muller's. Miss Gordon knows the place. I think Muller's drugs are perhaps fresher than those of most druggists, and that makes a great deal of difference.' He had risen and was politely and suavely bowing them out of another door, at the same time by pressing a button signifying to his attendant to admit the next patient. Constance had preceded Adele, 
and as she passed through the other door, she overheard the doctor whisper to her friend, I'm going to stop for you tonight to take a ride. I have something important I want to say to you. She did not catch Adele's answer, but as they left the marble and onyx brass-grilled entrance, Adele remarked, That's his car, over there. Oh, but he is a reckless driver, dashes along pell-mell, but always seems to have his eye out for everything, never seems to be arrested, never in an accident. Constance turned in the direction of the car and was startled to see the familiar face of Drummond across the street, dodging behind it. What was it now, she wondered? A divorce case? A scandal? What? The medicine was made up into little powders to be taken until they gave relief, and Constance folded the paper of one, poured it on the back of her tongue, and swallowed a glass of water afterward. Her head continued to throb, but she felt a sense of well-being that she had not before. Adele urged her to take another, and Constance did so. The second powder increased the effect of the first marvelously, but Constance noticed that she now began to feel queer. She was not used to taking medicine. For a moment she felt that she was above, beyond the reach of ordinary rules and laws. She could have done any sort of physical task, she felt, no matter how difficult. She was amazed at herself, as compared to what she had been only a few moments before. "'Another one?' asked Adele finally. Constance was by this time genuinely alarmed at the sudden, unwanted effect on herself. N no she replied dubiously. I don't think I want to take any more, just yet. Not another? asked Adele in surprise. I wish they would affect me that way. Sometimes I have to take the whole dozen before they have any effect. They chatted for a few minutes, and finally Adele rose. Well, she remarked with a nervous twitching of her body, as if she were eager to be doing something, I really must be going. I can't say I feel any too well myself. I think I'll take a walk with you, answered Constance, who did not like the continued effect of the two powders. I feel the need of exercise and air. Adele hesitated, but Constance already had her hat on. She had seen Drummond watching Dr. Price's door, and it interested her to know whether he could possibly have been following Adele or someone else. As they walked along, Adele quickened her pace until they came again to the drugstore. I believe I'll go in and get something, she remarked, pausing. For the first time in several minutes, Constance looked at the face of her friend. She was amazed to discover that Adele looked as if she had had a spell of sickness. Her eyes were large and glassy, her skin cold and sweaty, and she looked positively pallid and thin. As they entered the store, Muller, the druggist, bowed again and looked at Adele a moment as she leaned over the counter and whispered something to him. Without a word, he went into the arcana behind the partition that cuts off the mysteries of the prescription room in every drug store from the front of the store. When Muller returned, he handed her a packet, for which she paid, and which she dropped quickly into her pocketbook, hugging the pocketbook close to herself. Adele turned and was about to hurry from the store with Constance. "'Oh, excuse me,' she said suddenly, as if she had just recollected something. "'I promised a friend of mine I telephoned this afternoon, and I have forgotten to do it. I see a pay station here. Constance waited. Adele returned much quicker than one would have expected she could call up a number, but Constance thought nothing of it at the time. She did notice, however, that as her friend emerged from the booth, a most marvelous change had taken place in her. Her step was firm, her eye clear, her hand steady. Whatever it was, reasoned Constance, it could not have been serious to have disappeared so quickly. It was with some curiosity as to just what she might expect that Constance went around to the famous cabaret that night. The Mayfair occupied two floors of what had been a wide brownstone house before business and pleasure had crowded the residence district further and further uptown. It was a very well-known bohemian rendezvous, where under, demi, and upper world rubbed elbows without friction and seemed to enjoy the novelty and be willing to pay for it. Adele, who was one of the performers, had not arrived yet, but Constance, who had come with her mind still full of the two unexpected encounters with Drummond, was startled to see him here again. Fortunately, he did not see her, and she slipped unobserved into an angle near the window, overlooking the street. Drummond had been engrossed in watching someone already there, and Constance made the best use she could of her eyes to determine who it was. The outdoor walk and a good dinner had checked her headache and now the excitement of the chase of something, she knew not what, completed the cure. It was not long before she discovered that Drummond was watching intently, without seeming to do so, 
a nervous-looking fellow whose general washed-out appearance of face was especially unattractive for some reason or other. He was very thin, very pale, and very starry about the eyes. Then, too, it seemed as if the bone in his nose was going, due perhaps to the shrinkage of the blood vessels from some cause. Constance noticed a couple of girls whom she had seen Adele speak to on several other occasions approaching the young man. There came an opportune lull in the music, and from around the corner of her protecting angle, Constance could just catch the greeting of one of the girls. "'Hello, sleigh bells! Got any snow?' It was a remark that seemed particularly mal apropos to the sultry weather, and Constance half expected a burst of laughter at the unexpected sally. Instead, she was surprised to hear the young man reply in a very serious and matter-of-fact manner. "'Sure. Got any money, May?' She craned her neck, carefully avoiding coming into Drummond's line of vision, and as she did so, she saw two silver quarters gleam momentarily from hand to hand, and the young man passed each girl stealthily a small white paper packet. Others came to him, both men and women. It seemed to be an established thing, and Constance noted that Drummond watched it all covertly. "'Who is that?' asked Constance of the waiter, who had served her sometimes when she had been with Adele and knew her. "'Why, they call him Sleighbells Charlie,' he replied. "'A coke fiend.' "'Which means a cocaine fiend, I suppose?' she queried. "'Yes. He's a lobby gal for the grapevine system they have now of selling the dope in spite of this new law.' "'Where does he get the stuff?' she asked. The waiter shrugged his shoulders. "'Nobody knows, I guess. I don't. But he gets it in spite of the law and peddles it. Oh, it's all adulterated, with some white stuff, I don't know what, and the price they charge is outrageous.' They must make an ounce retail at five or six times the cost. Oh, you can bet that someone who is at the top is making a pile of money out of that graft, all right. He said it, not with any air of righteous indignation, but with a certain envy. Constance was thinking the thing over in her mind. Where did the coke come from? The grapevine system interested her. Sleighbell seemed to have disposed of all the coke he had brought with him. As the last packet went, he rose slowly and shuffled out. Constance, who knew that Adele would not come for some time, determined to follow him. She rose quietly, and under cover of a party going out, managed to disappear without, as far as she knew, letting Drummond catch a glimpse of her. This would not only employ her time, but it was better to avoid Drummond as far as possible, at present, too, she felt. At a distance of about half a block she followed the curiously shuffling figure. He crossed the avenue, turned and went uptown, turned again, and before she knew it, disappeared in a drugstore. She had been so engrossed in following the lobby gal that it was with a start that she realized that he had entered Muller's. What did it all mean? Was the druggist Muller the man higher up? She recalled suddenly her own experience of the afternoon. Had Muller tried to palm off something on her? The more she thought of it, the more sure she was that the powder she had taken had been doped. Slowly, turning the matter over in her mind, she returned to the Mayfair. As she peered in cautiously before entering, she saw that Drummond had gone. Adele had not come in yet, and she went in and sat down again in her old place. Perhaps half an hour later, outside, she heard a car drive up with a furious rattle of gears. She looked out of the window, and, as far as she could determine in the shadows, it was Dr. Price. A woman got out, Adele. For a moment she stopped to talk, then Dr. Price waved a gay goodbye and was off, all she could catch was a hasty, No, I don't think I'd better come in tonight, from him. As Adele entered the Mayfair, she glanced about, caught sight of Constance, and came and sat down by her. It would have been impossible for her to enter unobserved, so popular was she. It was not long before the two girls whom Constance had seen dealing with sleigh bells sauntered over. Your friend was here tonight, remarked one to Adele. Which one? laughed Adele the one who admired your dancing the other night and wanted to take lessons. "'You mean the young fellow who was selling something?' asked Constance pointedly. "'Oh, no,' returned the girl quite casually. "'That was sleigh bells!' And they all laughed. Constance thought immediately of Drummond. "'The other one, then,' she said. "'The thick-set man who was all alone?' "'Yes, he went away afterward. Do you know him?' "'I've seen him somewhere,' evaded Constance. "'But I just can't quite place him.' She had not noticed Adele particularly until now. Under the light she had a peculiar worn look, the same as she had had before. The waiter came up to them. "'Your turn is next,' he hinted to Adele. "'Excuse me a minute,' she apologized to the rest of the party. 
I must fix up a bit. No, she added to Constance, don't come with me. She returned from the dressing room a different person and plunged into the wild dance for which the limited orchestra was already tuning up. It was a veritable riot of whirl and rhythm. Never before had Constance seen Adele dance with such abandon. As she executed the wild mazes of a newly imported dance, she held even the jaded Mayfair spellbound. And when she concluded with one daring figure and sat down, flushed and excited, the diners applauded and even shouted approval. It was an event for even the dance-mad Mayfair. Constance did not share in the applause. At last she understood. Adele was a dope fiend, too. She felt it with a sense of pain. Always, she knew, the fiends tried to get away alone, somewhere for a few minutes, to snuff some of their favorite nepenthe. She had heard before of the cocaine snuffers, who took a little of the deadly powder, placed it on the back of the hand, and inhaled it up the nose with a quick intake of breath. Adele was one. It was not Adele who danced. It was the dope. Constance was determined to speak. "'You remember that man the girls spoke of?' she began. "'Yes, what of him?' asked Adele with almost a note of defiance. "'Well, I really do know him,' confessed Constance. "'He is a detective.' Constance watched her companion curiously, for at the mere word she had stopped short and faced her. "'He is?' she asked quickly. "'Then that was why, Dr. Price—' She managed to suppress the remark and continued her walk home without another word. In Adele's little apartment, Constance was quick to note that the same haggard look had returned to her friend's face. Adele had reached for her pocketbook with a sort of clutching eagerness and was about to leave the room. Constance rose. "'Why don't you give up the stuff?' she asked earnestly. "'Don't you want to?' For a moment Adele faced her angrily. Then her real nature seemed slowly to come to the surface. "'Yes,' she murmured frankly. "'Then why don't you?' pleaded Constance. I haven't the power. There's an indescribable excitement to do something great, to make a mark. It's soon gone. But while it lasts, I can sing, dance, do anything. And then every part of my body begins crying for more of the stuff again. There was no longer any necessity of concealment from Constance. She took a pinch of the stuff, placed it on the back of her wrist, and quickly sniffed it. The change in her was magical. From a quivering, wretched girl, she became a self-confident neurasthenic. "'I don't care,' she laughed hollowly now. "'Yes, I know what you're going to tell me. Soon I'll be hunting the cocaine bug, as they call it, imagining that in my skin, under the flesh, are worms crawling. Perhaps see them, see the little animals running around and biting me.' She said it with a half-reckless cynicism. "'Oh, you don't know. There are two souls in the cocainist, one tortured by the pain of not having the stuff, the other laughing and mocking at the dangers of it. It stimulates. It makes your mind work, without effort, by itself, and it gives such visions of success, makes you feel able to do so much, and to forget. All the girls use it. Where do they get it? asked Constance. I thought the new law prohibited it. Get it? repeated Adele. Why, they get it from that fellow they call sleigh bells. They call it snow, you know, and the girls who use it snowbirds. The law does prohibit its sale, but she paused significantly yes agreed constance but sleigh bells is only a part of the system after all who is the man at the top adele shrugged her shoulders and was silent still constance did not fail to note a sudden look of suspicion which adele shot at her was adele shielding someone constance knew that someone must be getting rich from the traffic probably selling hundreds of ounces a week and making thousands of dollars Somehow she felt a sort of indignation at the whole thing. Who was it? Who was the man higher up? End of Part 1 of Chapter 11 Chapter 11, Part 2 of Constance Dunlap by Arthur B. Reeve This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Dope Fiends Continued in the morning, as she was working about her little kitchenette, an idea came to her. Why not hire the vacant apartment across the hall from Adele? An optician, who was a friend of hers, in the course of a recent conversation, had mentioned an invention, a model of which he had made for the inventor. She would try it. Since, with Constance, the outlining of a plan was tantamount to the execution, it was not many hours later 
before she had both the apartment and the model of the invention. Her wall separated her from the drug store, and by careful calculation she determined about where came the little prescription department. Carefully, so as to arouse no suspicion, she began to bore away at the wall with various tools, until finally she had a small, almost imperceptible opening. It was tedious work, and toward the end needed great care so as not to excite suspicion. But finally she was rewarded. Through it she could see just a trace of daylight, and by squinting could see a row of bottles on a shelf opposite. Then, through the hole, she pushed a long, narrow tube, like a putty-blower. When, at last, she placed her eye at it, she gave a low exclamation of satisfaction. She could now see the whole of the little room. It was a detectoscope invented by Gaylord Smith, adapter of the detectaphone, an instrument built up on the principle of the cytoscope, which physicians use to explore internally down the throat. Only in the end of the tube, instead of an ordinary lens, was placed what is known as a fisheye lens, which had a range something like nature has given the eyes of fishes, hence the name. Ordinarily, cameras, because of the flatness of their lenses, have a range of only a few degrees, the greatest being scarcely more than ninety. But this lens was globular, and like a drop of water, refracted light from all directions. When placed so that half of it caught the light, it saw through an angle of a hundred and eighty degrees, saw everything in the room, instead of just that little row of bottles on the shelf opposite. Constance set herself to watch, and it was not long before her suspicions were confirmed, and she was sure that this was nothing more than a coke joint. Still, she wondered whether Muller was the real source of the traffic of which Sleighbells was the messenger. She was determined to find out. All day she watched through her detectoscope. Once she saw Adele come in and buy more dope. It was with difficulty that she kept from interfering. But, she reflected, the time was not ripe. She had thought the thing out. There was no use in trying to get at it through Adele. The only way was to stop the whole curse at its source, to damn the stream. People came and went. She soon found that he was selling them packets from a box hidden in the woodwork. That much she had learned, anyhow. Constance watched faithfully all day, with only time enough taken out for dinner. It was after her return from this brief interval that she felt her heart give a leap of apprehension, as she looked again through the detectoscope. There was Drummond in the back of the store, talking to Muller and a woman who looked as if she might be Mrs. Muller, for both seemed nervous and anxious. As nearly as she could make out, Drummond was alternately threatening and arguing with Muller. Finally, the three seemed to agree, for Drummond walked over to a typewriter on a table, took a fresh sheet of carbon paper from a drawer, placed it between two sheets of paper, and hastily wrote something. Drummond read over what he had written. It seemed to be short, and the three apparently agreed on it. Then, in a trembling hand, Muller signed the two copies which Drummond had made, one of which Drummond himself kept, and the other he sealed in an envelope and sent away by a boy. Drummond reached into his pocket and pulled out a huge roll of bills of large denomination. He counted out what seemed to be approximately half, handed it to the woman, and replaced the rest in his pocket. What it was all about, Constance could only vaguely guess. She longed to know what was in the letter, and why the money had been paid to the woman. Perhaps a quarter of an hour after Drummond left, Adele appeared again, pleading for more dope. Muller went back of the partition and made up a fresh paper of it, from a bottle also concealed. Constance was torn by conflicting impulses. She did not want to miss anything in the perplexing drama that was being enacted before her, yet she wished to interfere with the deadly course of Adele. Still, perhaps the girl would resent interference if she found out that Constance was spying on her. She determined to wait a little while before seeing Adele. It was only after a decided effort that she tore herself away from the detectoscope and knocked on Adele's door, as if she had just come in for a visit. Again she knocked, but still there was no answer. Every minute something might be happening next door. She hurried back to her post of observation. One of the worst aspects of the use of cocaine, she knew, was the desire of the user to share his experience with someone else. The passing on of the habit, which seemed to be one of the strongest desires of the drug fiend, made him even more dangerous to society than he would otherwise have been. That thought 
gave Constance an idea. She recalled also now, having heard somewhere, that it was a common characteristic of these poor creatures to have a passion for fast automobiling, to go on long rides, perhaps even without having the money to pay for them. That, too, confirmed the idea which she had. As the night advanced, she determined to stick to her post. What could it have been that Drummond was doing? It was no good, she felt positive. Suddenly, before her eye, glued to its eavesdropping aperture, she saw a strange sight. There was a violent commotion in the store. Blue-coated policemen seemed to swarm in from nowhere, and in the rear, directing them, appeared Drummond, holding by the arm the unfortunate sleigh bells, quaking with fear, evidently having been picked up already elsewhere by the wily detective. Muller put up a stout resistance, but the officers easily seized him and, after a hasty but thorough search, unearthed his cash of the contraband drug. As the scene unfolded, Constance was more and more bewildered after having witnessed what had preceded it, the signing of the letter and the passing of the money. Muller evidently had nothing to say about that. What did it mean? The police were still holding Muller, and Constance had not noted that Drummond had disappeared. "'It's on the first floor. Left, men,' sounded a familiar voice outside her own door. "'I know she's there. My shadow saw her buy the dope and take it home.' Her heart was thumping wildly. It was Drummond leading his squad of raiders, and they were about to enter the apartment of Adele. They knocked, but there was no answer. A few moments before, Constance would have felt perfectly safe in saying that Adele was out. But if Drummond's man had seen her enter, might she not have been there all the time, be there still, in a stupor? She dreaded to think of what might happen if the poor girl once fell into their hands. It would be the final impulse that would complete her ruin. Constance did not stop to reason it out. Her woman's intuition told her that now was the time to act, that there was no retreat. She opened her own door just as the raiders had forced in the flimsy affair that guarded the apartment of Adele. So, sneered Drummond, catching sight of her in the dim light of the hallway, you are mixed up in these violations of the new drug law, too. Constance said nothing. She had determined first to make Drummond display his hand. Well, he ground out, I'm going to get these people this time. I represent the Medical Society and the Board of Health. These men have been assigned to me by the commissioner as a dope squad. We want this girl. We have others who will give evidence. But we want this one, too. He said it with a bluster that even exaggerated the theatrical character of the raid itself. Constance did not stop to weigh the value of his words, but through the door she brushed quickly. Adele might need her if she was indeed there. As she entered the little living room, she saw a sight which almost transfixed her. Adele was there, lying across a divan, motionless. Constance bent over. Adele was cold. As far as she could determine, there was not a breath or a heartbeat. What did it mean? She did not stop to think. Instantly there flashed over her the recollection of an instrument she had read about at one of the city hospitals. It might save Adele. Before anyone knew what she was doing, she had darted to the telephone in the lower hall of the apartment and had called up the hospital frantically, imploring them to hurry. Adele must be saved. Constance had no very clear idea of what happened next in the hurly-burly of events, until the ambulance pulled up at the door and the white-coated surgeon burst in carrying a heavy suitcase. With one look at the unfortunate girl, he muttered, "'Paralysis of the respiratory organs. Too large a dose of the drug. You did perfectly right,' and began unpacking the case. Constance, calm now in the crisis, stood by him and helped as deftly as could any nurse. It was a curious arrangement of tubes and valves with a large rubber bag and a little pump that the doctor had brought. Quickly he placed a cap attached to it over the nose and mouth of the poor girl and started the machine. Well, "'What is it?' gasped Drummond, as he saw Adele's hitherto motionless breast now rise and fall. "'A pull motor,' replied the doctor, working quickly and carefully. "'An artificial lung. Sometimes it can revive even the medically dead. It is our last chance with this girl.' Constance had picked up the packet which had fallen beside Adele and was looking at the white powder. "'Almost pure cocaine,' remarked the young surgeon, testing it. "'The hydrochloride, large crystals, highest quality. Usually it is adulterated. Was she in the habit of taking it this way?' Constance said nothing. 
she had seen Muller make up the packet, specially now, she recalled, instead of the adulterated dope he had given Adele the purest kind. Why? Was there some secret he wished to lock in her breast forever? Mechanically, the pull motor pumped. Would it save her? Constance was living over what she had already seen through the detectoscope. Suddenly, she thought of the strange letter and of the money. She hurried into the drugstore. Muller had already been taken away, but before the officer left in charge could interfere, she picked up the carbon sheet on which the letter had been copied, turned it over, and held it eagerly to the light. She read in amazement. It was a confession. In it, Muller admitted to Dr. Moreland Price that he was the head of a sort of dope trust, that he had messengers out like sleigh bells, that he had often put dope in the prescriptions sent him by the doctor, and had repeatedly violated the law and refilled such prescriptions. On its face it was complete and convincing. Yet it did not satisfy Constance. She could not believe that Adele had committed suicide. Adele must possess some secret. What was it? "'Is there any change?' she asked anxiously of the young surgeon now engrossed in his work. For answer he merely nodded to the apparently motionless form on the bed, and for a moment stopped the pull motor. The mechanical movement of the body ceased, but in its place was a slight tremor about the lips and mouth. Adele moved, was faintly gasping for breath. "'Adele!' cried Constance softly in her ear. "'Adele!' Something, perhaps a faraway answer of recognition, seemed to flicker over her face. The doctor redoubled his efforts. "'Adele, do you know me?' whispered Constance again. "'Yes,' came back faintly at last. "'There, there's something wrong with it. They, they—' "'How? What do you mean?' urged Constance. "'Tell me, Adele.' The girl moved uneasily. The doctor administered a stimulant, and she vaguely opened her eyes— began to talk hazily, dreamily. Constance bent over to catch the faint words which would have been lost to the others. "'They are going to dove across the health department,' she murmured as if to herself. Then, gathering strength, she went on. "'Muller and Sleighbells will be arrested and take the penalty. They have been caught with the goods, anyhow. It has all been arranged so that the detective will get his case. Money will be paid to both of them, to Muller and the detective.' to swing the case and protect him. He made me do it. I saw the detective, even danced with him, and he agreed to do it. Oh, I would do anything. I am his willing tool when I have the stuff. But this time it was... She rambled off incoherently. Who made you do it? Who told you? prompted Constance. For whom would you do anything? Adele moaned and clutched Constance's hand convulsively. Constance did not pause to consider the ethics of questioning a half-conscious girl. Her only idea was to get at the truth. "'Who was it?' she reiterated. Adele turned weakly. "'Dr. Price,' she murmured, as Constance bent her ear to catch even the faintest sound. "'He told me all about it last night in the car.' Instantly Constance understood. Adele was the only one outside who held the secret— who could upset the carefully planned frame-up that was to protect the real head of the dope trust, who had paid liberally to save his own wretched skin. She rose quickly and wheeled about suddenly on Drummond. "'You will convict Dr. Price also,' she said in a low tone. "'This girl must not be dragged down to. You will leave her alone, and both you and Mr. Muller will hand over that money to her for her cure of the habit.' Drummond started forward angrily, but fell back as Constance added, in a lower but firmer tone, or I'll have you all up on a charge of attempting murder. Drummond turned surly to those of his dope squad who remained. You can go, boys, he said brusquely. There has been some mistake here. End of chapter 11「The Fugitives " Newspaper pictures seldom look like the person they represent," asserted Lawrence Macy nonchalantly. Constance Dunlap looked squarely at the man opposite her at the table, oblivious to the surroundings. It was a brilliant sight in the great after-theatre rendezvous, the beautiful faces and gowns, 
the exquisite music, the bright lights, and the gaiety. She had chosen this time and place for a reason. She had hoped that the contrast with what she had to say would be most marked in its influence on the man. Nevertheless, she replied keenly, I recognize the picture, as though you were Bertillon's new spoken portrait of this Graham Mackenzie. She deliberately folded up a newspaper clipping and shoved it into her handbag on a chair beside the table. Lawrence Macy met her eye unflinchingly. Suppose, he drawled, just for the sake of argument, that you are right. What would you do? Constance looked at the unruffled exterior of the man. With her keen perception she knew that it covered just as calm an interior. He would have said the same thing if she had been a real detective, had walked up behind him suddenly in the subway crush, had tapped his shoulder, and whispered, "'You're wanted.' "'We are dealing with facts, not suppositions,' she replied evasively. Momentarily a strange look passed over Macy's face. What was she driving at? Blackmail? He could not think so, even though he had only just come to know Constance. He rejected the thought, before it was half formed. "'Put it as you please,' he persisted. "'I am, then, this Graham Mackenzie, who has decamped from Omaha with half a million. It is half a million in the article, is it not? Of cash and unregistered stocks and bonds. Now what would you do?' Constance felt unconsciously the shift which she had skillfully made in their positions. Instead of being the pursuer, she was now the pursued, at least in their conversation. He had admitted nothing of what her quick intuition told her. Yet she felt an admiration for the sang-froid of Macy. She felt a spell thrown over her by the magnetic eyes that seemed to search her own. They were large eyes, the eyes of a dreamer rather than of a practical man, eyes of a man who goes far and travels long with the woman on whom he fixes them solely. "'You haven't answered my hypothetical question,' he reminded her. She brought herself back with a start. I was only thinking, she murmured. Then there is doubt in your mind what you would do? No, she hesitated. He bent over nearer across the table. You would at least recall the old adage, do unto others as you would that they should do unto you, he urged. It was uncanny, the way this man read her thoughts. You know whom they say, quotes scripture, she avoided. And I am a, a devil? I did not say so. You hinted it she had but she said no nor hinted it then you did not mean to hint it she looked away a moment at the gay throng graham mackenzie she said slowly what's the use of all this beating about why cannot we be frank with one another she paused then resumed meditatively a long time ago i became involved with a man in a scheme to forge checks i would have done anything for him anything a cloud passed over his face she saw it had been watching for it, but appeared not to do so. His was a nature to brook no rivalry. My husband had become involved in extravagances for which I was to blame, she went on. The cloud settled, and in its place came a look of intense relief. He was like most men. Whatever his own morals, he demanded a high standard in her. We formed an amateur partnership in crime, she hurried on. He lost his life, was unable to stand up against the odds while he was alone, away from me. Since then I have been helping those who have become involved on the wrong side with the law. There, she concluded simply, I have put myself in your power. I have admitted my part in something that, try as they would, they could never connect me with. I have done it because, because I want to help you. Be as frank with me. He eyed her keenly again. The appeal was irresistible. I can tell you Graham Mackenzie's story, he began carefully. Six months ago, there was a young man in Omaha who had worked faithfully for a safe deposit company for years. He was getting eighty-five dollars a month. That is more than it seems to you here in New York, but it was very little for what he did. Why, as superintendent of the safe deposit vaults, he had helped to build up that part of the trust company's business to such an extent that he knew he deserved more. Now, a superintendent of a safe deposit vault has lots of chances. Sometimes depositors give him their keys to unlock their boxes for them. It is a simple thing to make an impression in wax or chewing gum palmed in the hand. Or he has access to a number of keys of unrented boxes. He can, as opportunity offers, make duplicates. And then when the boxes are rented, he has a key. Even if the locks of unrented boxes are blanks, set by the first insertion of the key chosen at random, he can still do the same thing. 
and even if it takes two to get at all the idle keys, himself and another trusted employee, he can get at them, if he is clever, without the other officer knowing it, though it may be done almost before his eyes. You see, it all comes down to the honesty of the man. He paused. Constance was fascinated at the coolness with which this man had gone to work, and with which he told of it. This superintendent earned more than he received. He deserved it. But when he asked for a raise, they told him he was lucky to keep the job. They reduced him, instead, to seventy-five dollars. He was angry at the stinging rebuke. He determined to make them smart, to show them what he could do. One noon he went out to lunch, and they have been looking for him ever since. He had taken half a million in cash, stocks, and bonds, unregistered, and hence easily hypothecated, and traded on. And his motive? she asked. He looked at her long and earnestly, as if making up his mind to something. I think, he replied, I wanted revenge quite as much as the money. He said it slowly, measured, as if realizing that there was now nothing to be gained by concealment from her, as if only he wanted to put himself in the best light with the woman who had won from him his secret. It was his confession. Acquaintances with Constance ripened fast into friendships. She had known Macy, as he called himself, only a fortnight. He had been introduced to her at a sort of bohemian gathering, had talked to her, direct, as she liked a man to talk. He had seen her home that night, had asked to call, and on the other nights had taken her to the theater and to supper. Delicately unconsciously, a bond of friendship had grown up between them. She felt that he was a man vibrating with physical and mental power, long latent, which nothing but a strong will held in check, a man by whom she could be fascinated, yet of whom she was just a little bit afraid. With Macy it would have been difficult to analyze his feelings. He had found in Constance a woman who had seen the world in all its phases, yet had come through unstained by what would have drowned some in the depths of the underworld, or thrust others into the degradation of the demi-monde, at least. He admired and respected her. He, the dreamer, saw in her the practical. She, an adventurer in amateur lawlessness, saw in him something kindred at heart. And so, when a newspaper came to her in which she recognized with her keen insight Lawrence Macy's face under Graham Mackenzie's name, and a story of embezzlement of trust company and other funds from the Omaha Central Western Trust of half a million, she had not been wholly surprised. Instead, she felt almost a sense of elation. The man was neither better nor worse than herself, and he needed help. Her mind wandered back to a time, months before, when she had learned the bitter lesson of what it was to be a legal outcast, and had determined always to keep within the law, no matter how close to the edge of things she went. Mackenzie continued looking at her, as if waiting for the answer to his first question. No, she said slowly, I am not going to hand you over. I never had any such intention. We are in each other's power. But you cannot go about openly, even in New York, now. Someone besides myself must have seen that article. Graham listened blankly. It was true. He fancied security in the city was over. He had fled to New York because there, in the mass of people, he could best sink his old identity and take on a new. She leaned her head on her hand and her elbow on the table and looked deeply into his eyes. Let me take those securities, she said. I will be able to do safely what you cannot do. Graham did not seem now to consider the fortune for which he had risked so much. The woman before him was enough. Will you? he asked eagerly. I will do with them as I would for myself. Better, because, because it is a trust, she accepted. More than a trust, as he leaned over in turn, and, in spite of other diners in the restaurant, took her hand. There were times when the rest of the critical world and its frigid opinions are valueless. Constance did not withdraw her hand. Rather, she watched in his eyes the subtle physical change in the man that her very touch produced, watched and felt a response in herself. Quickly, she withdrew her hand. "'I must go,' she said rather hurriedly. "'It is getting late.' "'Constance,' he whispered, as he helped her on with her wraps, brushing the waiter aside that he might himself perform any duty that involved even touching her. "'Constance!' I am in your hands. 
absolutely. It had been pleasant to dine with him. It was more pleasant now to feel her influence and power over him. She knew it, though she only half admitted it. They seemed for the moment to walk on air as they strolled, chatting, out to a taxicab. But as the cab drew up before her own apartment, the familiar associations of even the entrance brought her back to reality suddenly. He handed her out, and the excitement of the evening was over. She saw the thing in its true light. This was the beginning, not the end. Graham, she said as she lingered for a moment at the door, tomorrow we must find a place where you can hide. I may see you, though, he asked anxiously. Of course. Ring me up in the morning, Graham. Good night. And she was whisked up in the elevator, leaving Mackenzie with a sense of loss and loneliness. By the Lord, he muttered, as he swung down the street in preference to taking a cab. What a woman that is! Together, the next day, they sought out a place where he could remain hidden. Mackenzie would have been near her, but Constance knew better. She chose a bachelor apartment where the tenants never arose before noon, and where night was turned into day. Men would not ask questions. In an apartment like her own, there was nothing but gossip. In the daytime, he stayed at home. Only at night did he go forth, and then, under her direction, in the most unfrequented ways. Every day Constance went to Wall Street, where she had established confidential relations with a number of brokers. Together they planned the campaigns. She executed them with consummate skill and adroitness. Constance was amazed. Here was a man who for years had been able to earn only eighty-five dollars a month and had not seemed to show any ability. Yet he was able to speculate in Wall Street with such dash that he seemed to be in a fair way, through her, to accumulate a fortune. One night, as they were hurrying back to Graham's after a walk, they had to pass a crowd on Broadway. Constance saw a familiar face hurrying by. It gave her a start. It was Drummond, the detective. He was not apparently looking for her, but then that was his method. He might have been looking. At any rate, it reminded her unpleasantly of the fact that there were detectives in the world. "'What's the matter?' asked Graham, noticing the change in her. "'I just saw a man I know.' The old jealousy flushed his face. Constance laughed in spite of her fears. Indeed, there was something that pleased her in his jealousy. "'He was the detective who has been hounding me ever since that time I told you about.' "'Oh,' he subsided. But if Drummond had been there, Mackenzie could have been counted on to risk all to protect her. We must be more careful, she shuddered. End of Part 1 of Chapter 12、Chapter 12, Part 2 of Constance Dunlap by Arthur B. Reeve. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fugitives Continued. Constance was startled one evening just as she was going out to meet Graham and report on the progress of the day at hearing a knock at her door. She opened it. "'I suppose you think I am your nemesis,' introduced Drummond, as he stepped in, veiling the keenness of his search by an attempt to be familiar. She had more than half expected it. She said nothing, but her coldness was plainly one of interrogation. "'A case has been placed in my hands by some Western clients of ours,' he said by way of swaggering explanation of an embezzler who is hiding in new york it required no great reasoning power to decide that the man's trail would sooner or later cross wall street i believe it has done so not directly but indirectly the trail i think has brought me back to the proverbial point of chercher la femme i am delighted he dwelt on the word to see what would be its effect to see in the graham mackenzie case my old friend constance dunlap so she replied quietly. You suspect me now. I suppose I am Graham Mackenzie. No, Drummond replied dubiously. You are not Graham Mackenzie, of course. You may be Mrs. Graham Mackenzie, for all I know, but I believe you are the receiver of Graham Mackenzie's stolen goods. You do, she answered calmly. That remains for you to prove. Why do you believe it? Is it because you are ready to believe anything of me? I have noticed that you are more active downtown than— "'Oh, it is because I speculate. Have I no means of my own?' she asked pointedly. 
where is he not here i know but where insinuated drummond with a knowing look am i my brother's keeper she laughed merrily come now who is this wonderful graham mackenzie first show me that i know him you know the rule in a murder case you must prove the corpus delecti drummond was furious she was so baffling that was his weak point and she had picked it out infallibly whatever his suspicions he had been able to prove nothing though he suspected much in the buying and selling of constance a week of bitterness a constant struggle against the wiles of one of the most subtle sleuths followed avoiding hidden traps that beset her on every side was this to be the end of it was drummond's heroic effort to entangle her to succeed at last she felt that a watch of the most extraordinary kind was set on her an invisible net woven about her eyes that never slept were upon her there was no minute in her regular haunts that she was not guarded she knew it though she could not see it it was a war of subtle wits yet from the beginning constance was the winner of every move she was on her mettle they would not she determined find graham through her days passed and the detective still had no sign of the missing man it seemed hopeless but like all good detectives drummond knew from experience that a clue might come to the surface when it was least expected constance on her part never relaxed one day it was a young woman dressed in most inconspicuous style who followed close behind her a woman's shadow one of the shrewdest in the city a tenant moved into the apartment across the hall from constance and another hired an apartment in the next house across the court there was constant espionage she seemed to sense it the newcomer was very neighborly explaining that her husband was a traveling salesman and that she was alone for weeks at a time the lines tightened the next-door neighbor always seemed to be around at mail time trying to get a look at the postmarks on the dunlap letters she had an excuse in the number of letters to herself orders for my husband she would smile he gets lots of them personally here all their ingenuity went for naught constance was not to be caught that way they tried new tricks if it was a journey she took someone went with her whom she had to shake off sooner or later there were visits of peddlers gasmen electric light and telephone men they were all detectives also always seeking a chance to make a search that might reveal her secret the janitor who collected the waste paper found that it had a ready sale at a high price every stratagem that drummond's astute mind could devise was called into play but nothing not a scrap of new evidence did they find yet all the time constance was in direct communication with mackenzie graham in his enforced idleness was more deeply in love with constance now than ever he had eyes for nothing else even his fortunes would have been disregarded had he not felt that to do that would have been the surest way to condemn himself before her they had cut out the evening trips now for fear of recognition she was working faithfully already she had cleaned up something like fifty thousand dollars on the turnover of the stuff he had stolen another week and it would be some thousands more yet the strain was beginning to show oh graham she cried one night after she had a particularly hard time in shaking drummond's shadows in order to make her unconventional visit to him graham i am so tired of it all tired he was about to pour out what was in his own heart when she resumed it's the lonesomeness of it we are having success but what is success alone yes he echoed thinking of his feeling that night when she had left him at the elevator of the feeling now every moment of the time she was away from him yes alone with the utmost difficulty he restrained the wildly surging emotions within him he could not know with what effort constance held her poise so admirably keeping always that barrier of reserve beyond which now and then he caught a glimpse let us cut out and bury ourselves in europe he urged no she replied firmly wait i have a plan wait we could never get away they would find us and extradite us surely she was coming out of a broker's office one day after the close of the market only to run full tilt into drummond who had been waiting for her cat-like evidently he had a purpose you will be interested to know remarked the detective watching her narrowly that district attorney wickham who had the case in charge out there is in new york with the president of the central western trust yes she said noncommittally i told them i was on the trail through a woman 
and they have come out here to aid me. Why had he told her that? Was it to put her on her guard, or was it in a spirit of bravado? She could not think so. It was not his style to bluster at this stage of the game. No, there was a deep-laid purpose. He expected her to make some move to extricate herself that would display her hand and betray all. It was clever, and a less clever person than Constance would have fallen before the onslaught. Constance was thinking rapidly, as he told her where and how the new pursuers were active. Here, she felt, was the crisis, her opportunity. Scarcely had Drummond gone than she, too, was hurrying down the street on her way to see Mackenzie's pursuers face to face. She found Wickham registered at the Prince Henry, a new hotel, and sent up her card. A few moments later he received her, with considerable restraint, as if he knew about her, and had not expected so soon to have to show his own hand. "'I understand,' she began quickly, "'that you have come to New York because Mr. Drummond claims to be able to clear up the Graham Mackenzie case.' "'Yes,' he replied quizzically. "'Perhaps,' she continued, coming nearer to the point of her self-imposed mission, "'perhaps there may be some other way to settle this case than through Mr. Drummond.' "'We might hold you.' he shot out quickly. No, she replied, you have nothing on me, and as for Mr. Mackenzie, I understand you don't even know where he is, whether he is in New York, London, Paris, or Berlin, or whether he may not go from one city to another at any moment you take open action. Wickham bit his lip. He knew she was right. Even yet, the case hung on the most slender threads. I have been wondering, she continued, if there is not some way in which this thing can be compromised. Never! exclaimed Wickham positively. He must return the whole sum with interest to date. Then, and only then, can we consider his plea for clemency. You would consider it? she asked keenly. Of course, we would have to consider it. Voluntary surrender and reparation would be something like turning state's witness against himself. Constance said nothing. Can you do it? he asked, watching craftily, to see whether she might not drop a hint that might prove valuable. I know those who might try— she answered, catching the look. Wickham changed. "'What if we should get him without your aid?' he blustered. "'Try,' she shrugged. Arguments and threats were of no avail with her. She would say nothing more definite. She was obdurate. "'You must leave it all to me,' she repeated. "'I would not betray him. You cannot prove anything on me.' "'Bring the stuff up here yourself, then,' he insinuated. "'But I don't trust you either,' she replied frankly. The two faced each other. Constance knew in her heart that it was going to be a battle royal with this man, that now she had taken a step even so far in the open it was every one for himself, and the devil take the hindmost. "'I can't help it,' he concluded. "'Those are the terms. It's as far as I can trust a—a a thief.' "'But I will keep my word,' she said quietly. "'When you prove to me that you are absolutely on the level, that Mackenzie can make restitution in full with interest, and in return be left as free a man as he is at this moment. Why, I can have him give up. Mrs. Dunlap, said Wickham with an air of finality, I will make one concession. I will adopt any method of restitution he may prefer, but it must be by direct dealing between Mackenzie and myself, with Drummond present, as well as Mr. Taylor, president of the trust company, who is now also in New York. That is my ultimatum. Good afternoon. Constance left the room with flushed face and eyes that glinted with determination. Over and over she thought out methods to accomplish what she had planned. When they complied with all the conditions that would safeguard Mackenzie, she had determined to act. But Graham must be master of the situation. Cautiously she went through her usual elaborate precautions to shake off any shadows that might be following her, and an hour later found her with Mackenzie. "'What has happened?' he asked eagerly, surprised at her early visit. Briefly, she ran over the events of the afternoon. "'Would you be willing,' she asked, "'to go to District Attorney Wickham, hand over the half-million with, say, twelve thousand dollars interest, in return for freedom?' Graham looked at Constance a moment, doubtfully. "'I would not do that,' he measured slowly. "'How do I know what they will do, the moment they get me in their power? No, almost, I would say, that I would not go there under any guarantee they might give.' I do not trust them. The indictment must be dismissed first. But they won't do that. The ultimatum was personal restitution. Constance was faced by an apparently insurmountable dilemma. She saw and agreed with the reasonableness of Graham's position. But there was the opposition and obstinacy of Wickham, 
the bitterness and unscrupulousness of Drummond. Here was a tremendous problem. How was she to meet it? For perhaps half an hour they sat in silence. One plan after another she rejected. Suddenly an idea occurred to her. Somewhere, in a bank, she had seen a method which might meet the difficulty. "'Tomorrow I will arrange it to suit both of you,' she cried confidently. "'How?' he asked. "'Trust it all to me,' she appealed. "'All,' replied Graham, rising and standing before her. "'All. I will do anything you say.' He was about to take her hand, but she rose. "'No, Graham, not now. There is work, the crisis. No, I must go. Trust me.' It was not until noon of the next day that he saw Constance again. There was an air of suppressed excitement about her as she entered the apartment and placed on a table before him a small oblong box of black enameled metal, beneath which was a roll of paper. Above was another, somewhat similar box, with another roll of paper. Constance attached the instrument to the telephone. An enigmatic conversation followed, and she hung up the receiver. A few minutes later, she took the stylus that was in the lower box. Hastily, across the blank paper, she wrote the words, We are ready. Mackenzie was too fascinated to ask questions. Suddenly, out of the corner of his eye, he saw something in the upper box move, as if of itself. It was a similar self-inking stylus. Watch! exclaimed Constance. Do you get this? wrote the spirit hand. Perfectly, she scrolled in turn. Go ahead, as you promised. The upper stylus was now moving freely at the ends of its two rigid arms, counterparts of those holding the lower stylus. We promise, it wrote, that in consideration of the return— What is it? interrupted Graham, as the meaning of the words even now began to dawn on him. A tell autograph, she replied simply, a long-distance rider which I have had installed over a leased wire from the hotel room of Wickham to meet the demands of you two. With it you write over wires— just as with the telephone you talk over wires. It is as though you took one of the old pantographs, split it in half, and had each half connected only by telephone wires. While you write on this transmitter, their receiver records for them what you write. Look! Of five hundred thousand dollars, it continued to write, in cash, stocks, and bonds, with interest to date. All proceedings against Graham Mackenzie will be dropped and the indictment quashed. Marshall Taylor, President, Central Western Trust, Maxim Wickham, District Attorney, Riley Drummond, Detective. "'It's even broader than I had hoped,' cried Constance in delight. "'Does that satisfy you, Graham?' "'Yes,' he murmured, not through hesitation, but from the suddenness and surprise of the thing. "'Then sign this,' she wrote quickly. "'In consideration of the dropping of all charges against me, I agree to tell the number and location of the safe deposit box in New York where the stocks and bonds I possess are located.' and to hand over a key and written order to the same. I now agree immediately to pay by check the balance of the half million, including interest. She stepped aside from the machine. With a tremor of eagerness, he seized the stylus, and underneath what she had written, wrote boldly the name, Graham Mackenzie. Next, Constance herself took the stylus. Place in the telautograph a blank check, she wrote. He will write in the name of the bank, the amount, and the signature. She did the same. Now, Graham, sign this check on the Universal Bank as Lawrence Macy, she said, writing in the amount. Mechanically, he took the stylus. His fingers trembled as he held it, but with an effort he controlled himself. It was too weird, too uncanny to be true. Here he was, without stirring forth from the security of his hiding place. There were his pursuers in their hotel. With the precautions taken by Constance, neither party knew where the other was. Yet they were in instant touch, not by the ear alone, but by handwriting itself. He placed the stylus on the paper. She had already written in the number of the check, the date, the bank, the amount, and the payee, Marshall Taylor. Hastily, Graham signed it, as though in fear that they might rescind their action before he could finish. Now, the securities, she said. I have withdrawn already the amount we have made trading. It is a substantial sum. Write out an order to the safe deposit company to deliver the key and the rest of the contents of the box to Taylor. I have fixed it with them after a special interview this morning. They understand. Again, Graham wrote feverishly. I, we are entirely free from prosecution of any kind, he asked eagerly. Yes, Constance murmured, with just a catch in her throat, as now that the excitement was over, 
she realized that he was free, independent of her again. The tell autograph had stopped. No, it was starting again. Had there been a slip? Was the dream at last to turn to ashes? They watched anxiously. Mrs. Dunlap, the words unfolded. I take my hat off to you. You have put it across again, Drummond. Constance read it with a sense of overwhelming relief. It was a magnanimous thing in Drummond. Almost she forgave him for many of the bitter hours he had caused in the discharge of his duty. As they looked at the writing, they realized its import. The detective had abandoned the long search. It was as though he had put his OK on the agreement. "'We are no longer fugitives!' exclaimed Graham, drawing in a breath that told of the weight lifted from him. For an instant he looked down into her upturned face and read the conflict that was going on in her. She did not turn away, as she had before. It flashed over him that once, not long ago, she had talked in a moment of confidence of the loneliness she had felt since she had embarked as the rescuer of amateur criminals. Graham bent down and took her hand, as he had the first night when they had entered their strange partnership. Never, never can I begin to pay you what I owe, he said huskily, his face near hers. He felt her warm breath almost on his cheek, saw the quick color come into her face, her breast rise and fall with suppressed emotion. Their eyes met. You need not pay, she whispered. I am yours. End of chapter 12 End of Constance Dunlap by Arthur B. Reeve